Good morning, and welcome to the 2016 Green Hills Convocation. We gathered together this morning for important reasons. To celebrate and honor the new year, to formally integrate our new sixth grade into the school culture, and finally to present to the class of 2017 the designation of school leaders. Green Hills School is a student-centered community that helps young people realize their full intellectual, ethical, artistic, and athletic potential in preparation for college and beyond as curious, creative, and responsible citizens who respect all individuals and their differences and whose meaningful and balanced lives will better the world. That's our mission statement. Schools have stated missions, and while many share some of the same words, each is ultimately unique. The words you just heard, intellectual, ethical, artistic, athletic, curious, creative, responsible, respect, these words matter to us. They're carefully chosen and they should be heard. Every school has a mission and each mission is unique. Much of what we do at our school and much of what happens at schools everywhere is centered around ritual and tradition. All communities come together around ritual. We see it expansively in this country on Independence Day and locally at dinner tables that host holiday meals. We remind ourselves what is important through these traditions and today is no exception. Convocation is how we choose to start our year at Green Hills. As you know by looking at your classmates, it's a formal event. And we all know that formal events are infused with a special significance. But I bet you all have your own beginning of the year traditions that might not be quite so formal. They might even be events you aren't aware are part of a tradition. Maybe it's shopping for school supplies, even if you're 18 years old. It might be the dinner the night before school starts. It might be picking out your first day clothes. For me, each year begins with a conversation with my old friend, Mark Luce. When I became a school administrator 15 years ago, the first person I hired was Mark Luce. I had never met him before, but during the interviewing process, I quickly realized he would be a great English teacher, which turned out to be true. And since then, he's become a great friend. In my very first year as head of upper school, when we had an important event at school where I was scheduled to speak, I would ask Mark for his advice. What should I talk about? Is there a poem I should share? A short piece of fiction? You see, Mark was and is a true scholar. His knowledge of literature is impressive. He used to write book reviews for the New York Times, Washington Post, the San Francisco Examiner, all the big newspapers. He received free books daily at his home from publishers who wanted his support. In short, he knew his stuff. So he seemed like an obvious resource for me. It's been about 10 years now since I worked with Mark, but it's still my personal ritual to ask him what I should talk about on the first day of school. This year, I didn't do what he said, but instead decided to save it for today. There's something else you should know about Mark. He's about my age, but he's still really cool. He listens to music I've never heard of. He seeks out pinball and pool halls. He wears tattered University of Kansas t-shirts and ratty baseball hats, sometimes back. He likes independent films, old detective novels, and he says, dude, way more than someone my age should say it. So I never know exactly what he's going to say to me, and that makes him particularly interesting. When we started this tradition, our conversations took place in person. After I stopped working with him, I called him. Now, as you might guess, texts. So here was our exchange last week. Me. First day of school is coming, what should I talk about? Mark. Learning. <coughs> Very helpful. <laughs> Learning. Stuff like that. Maybe read an article about dude who is inspiration for Red Wheelbarrow. Which is a poem that you might have studied or may study someday. Me. That sounds interesting. Okay, I read article. 
What's the point? Mark, what changes when we know more information? Does it help our understanding or limit our interpretation? Me, hmm. Maybe something lighter. Chicken soup for the teacher's soul. Mark, learned astronomer. Me. Oh, nice. That's a good one. What makes you think of it? Mark, be outside. See stuff. Gotta go. Me. Okay. Now, at this point, it might not be entirely obvious that this is a brilliant man, but trust me, he is. And while I often use his ideas, I don't always, but I always ask. And I ask because that's the tradition. That's the ritual. One of the ways I know that school is starting is the asking. And I ask to remind myself that education is, at least in part, about constructing and maintaining a lasting dialogue with people you know and people you respect. It's what happens every day here at school. You're doing that every day with your teachers and your classmates, constructing and maintaining a dialogue about subjects that are interesting and worth investigating. So here's Walt Whitman's Learned Astronomer. When I heard the Learned Astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were arranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I sitting heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon, unaccountable, I became tired and sick. Till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical, moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Now you can see why Mark Luce's analysis of this poem was on point. Go outside. See stuff for yourself. Perfect. The poem describes the way a scholar might share knowledge, and while those in attendance applauded, the poem's speaker needed to experience these stars firsthand to truly understand them. It seemed obvious to me, then, to explore this further with one of our resident astronomy experts, Dr. Dino Smith, and ask him his thoughts about this poem. He knew the poem, and his first response was, it doesn't necessarily make me think of astronomy, but instead of the writings of the philosopher Ludwig Josef Johann Wittgenstein that include the line, whereof we cannot speak, thereof we must remain silent. And I said, uh, yeah, me too. <laughs> and that's exactly what it made me think of. <laughs> Not really, I had no idea who that was. And Dr. Smith talked to me about the notion mentioned in the last line, when the speaker looks up in perfect silence at the stars, and how it's fascinating, because helioseismologists study the inside of stars by the vibrations they produce, and stars actually are incredibly, definitely loud. So when we look at stars and we stand, complete silence, we can know, because of the science, that in reality they are louder than we could ever know. And Dr. Smith went on to say that when we look into the sky, we see the universe unimaginably vast, and that relatively speaking, our existence is so tiny. But we have the unique ability to appreciate it, which is enormously profound. Now at this point, it is entirely obvious that I was speaking to a brilliant man. But the beauty of Green Hills is that we have a collection of brilliant, fascinating teachers, all of whom have broad, diverse interests and often surprising, unexpected areas of expertise. But your teachers aren't the keepers of all the wisdom. You have it too. And so do your classmates. I teach a writing class to seniors, and each year we begin by sharing important stories from our respective summers. It's a nice way to start the year, and it gets the storytelling juices flowing. This year, coincidentally, we had a few stories that fit nicely with the learned astronomer. Grace Geiger talked about sitting outside with her friends and looking into the sky like mathematicians might, discussing what, quadrant, what quadrants the stars occupied and connecting the dots to create 
parallelograms. And Ali Schulte shared the following story. Ali spent the summer as a camp counselor and she experienced the full range of emotions you might expect, ranging from severe crippling irritation <laughs> to inspiring elation. And Ali talked about young, one young camper who was feeling sad one night, and how Ali walked with her in the dark and pointed to different constellations in the stars in the sky. Allie explained to the girl that when she was younger, it would provide comfort to her to look at the stars and pick out the different formations. It was calming to her. For any of you who have worked with young children, you know that they can quickly become very attached to you if you're kind to them. And this is what happened with this camper and Allie. So one night the camper came and found Allie, who was perfectly content where she was at that moment, and tugged at her and said, Allie, come with me, come with me. And they went for a little walk together, and they reached a point where the view was good, and the camper said to Allie, look, it's the Big Dipper. We are all students, and we are all teachers. And as you can tell from what I've just told you, we all become better students when we understand how to use all the resources we have. And that includes your teachers, your friends, and your family. And we all become better teachers in the same way. And even then, sometimes the purest moments in your education will be when you wander off alone in the mystical, moist night air and look up in perfect silence at the stars. Have a wonderful, enlightened year.